at least the state's interpretation of that? The most restrictive is a straight line, but uh, and because you could have quite a length of shoreline, if you measure it in a, in a straight okay. line, that uh, um, could be quite a burden. I mean, the main coast is shortened from about 2,500 miles down to about uh, probably 500, mm -hmm. uh, not even 500, 250 perhaps. Um, and given the value of, of uh, waterfront real estate, uh, I think this is a very important definition uh, to reconsider. Okay. So, uh, Maureen, you'll pursue uh, when the state telephone numbers are open again. Uh, what? Uh, how much leeway we have in that definition? I guess what I'd like to do, just so we have some organization, how we go through this is quickly. Uh, I hope you, you've had a chance to, to look at this and pick up or either compare to your, your previous copy page by page and so we can get through uh, this in a reasonable amount of time. Any changes or questions remaining that we have on the 17 pages before us? Are there any other questions or, or corrections on page one, primarily definitions, other than the, uh, the mention of shore frontage? Okay, if we could uh, proceed to a blank page two. There it is. Any changes? This doesn't necessarily uh, follow directly with the, our previous, the, the June 26th draft. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Judy. Um, I have a, a general question. Uh, my notes indicated that under the definition of structure that Maureen had indicated that it needed some refining because it might include signs and so forth. Is that something, Maureen, that you will be working on? Yes. Okay. Um, two other comments then. Unless I can't find it in here, your, your um, introduction to this indicates that a definition for water dependent use has been added and it's not here and I didn't know if it was elsewhere or just was dropped out by the typist. Oh, excuse me. It, it was under as written as the, the state had it. Right. Never mind on that one. Then the the it's other. Yeah, it, that's that actually is my fault. It's it's the state listed as functionally yes. water dependent okay. instead of just water dependent. I missed it. My so apologies. Under yeah. The other thing is my notes indicated that um, we might have been adding a definition for wetland upland edge. Was that incorrect? No. We already have that definition. And actually, it, it's it's already in the ordinance. Just uh, under under wetland upland. Actually, it's under wetland upland edge rather than upland edge, and it's um, it's even more refined than what the state currently uses. And where would that be? Would it it's, be it's in 1913? It's in the existing ordinance. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Those are my only comments okay. on this page. Tim. Chairman, on the. Uh, to the fourth paragraph on page two where you go uh, through the different zones. Um, it appears as if, if you look at the one, two, three, fourth line, that the resource protection three floodplain zone and the shoreline performance overlay zone are the same zone because they're not divided by a comma. And since there is a colon uh, at, on the second line, I, I would suggest that all these uh, be punctuated by semicolons after the colon to make sure that people realize they're separate zones. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Anything else on page two? Page Anything here? Page four. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Judy. Um, I guess this again would be a question to our planner. Um, under B, resource protection two, she added the um, sentence, dimensional requirements of the resource protection to wetland protection zone shall be borrowed from the most restrictive abutting zone. Is there any reason why we would not want to add the similar sentence to both um, re resource protection one and resource protection three? Um, the, it's possible that's, uh, I suppose it's possible that someone may want to construct something in those zones, but if you compare the permitted uses charts, 
there it's extremely limited in what you can do in that zone anyway would the town feel uncomfortable if someone did want to um, divide up critical wetlands so um, we all have small lots to pitch our tents which we could do mm -hmm. couldn't we I, I if the if the intent is to have a, a minimum lot size I would like to write it in now um. I guess I guess I'd want to think about that a little bit more. Um, I know that uh, in talking with the attorney, there was a concern about if you're permitting something in, if you're not, if you're, if the ordinance is silent about what is permitted in the underlying zone and it's allowed in the shoreland zone, um, is it then an allowed use? And he's answered that question that no, it is not. If the underlying zone is silent, that it doesn't mean it's it's permitted because you've regulated in the shoreland zone. And I guess I'd want to check and see how much you are. And I'd have to go look at it again, but I know for, say, for campsites, um, I'm not sure how much of that you're allowed to do in a resource protection zone. And if you were allowed to do it, um, what would be lot size requirement that you would want? I know that the shoreland, shoreland zoning has a minimum lot size requirement for a private campsite, but it's not specifically a permitted use in that zone anyway. And it's questionable whether campsites or campgrounds are permitted use in town at all. Uh, they are referenced in the shoreland zone and I left them in there because I wasn't sure that you that they were they were totally out of the town. Well the way I read this and I may be reading it incorrectly is um, one the resource protection zones are ceasing to they will not be overlay zones they will be a new zone on the face of the earth and there will be no underlying zone right. anymore. Then if I were to go to the chart um, starting on page six of what is per permitted, it clearly states, this is just my for instance, that an individual campsite is permitted in an RP zone with no sorts of approval. Since there are no dimensional standards, why, if I were lucky to own land on the Great Pond, or, or not shoreland, but in a resource protection one, why couldn't I divide them into um, 100 by 100 foot square lots and sell them? Or, I mean, are we assuming subdivision approval would catch it, but there still wouldn't be any prohibition on a lot that small with there? I, I really would have to look into okay. that. I, I would like to see that. But other, if, if it was permitted, you would want to um, borrow the minimum lot sizes from the abutting zone? I think that's fine. I just would like to see some sort of standard in there. Anything else on page four? Page five. Mr. Chairman, I had one yes. more comment. Um, hmm? I still feel uncomfortable with including the slopes under the title of um, floodplain zones, but unless I can come up with an alternative, I'll certainly let it go. Uh, I, I did check with, with COG, and um, although they did check for sustained slopes of 20% or greater, she didn't recall finding any in Cape Elizabeth. So although this, you know, it's possible we could eliminate number two altogether since the town doesn't have any. And um, I, I can also check under number three to see if the town has um, any areas that were deliberately mapped um, as part of the shoreline zone which are subject to severe bank erosion. And if you have any suggestion for another name for the RP3 zone, I'd be happy to insert it. Any other comments? Page six. <coughs> Page seven. Yes, Just another question. Um, Maureen, were you going to look into under um, number 36, the no under RP3, if the state had considered um, upgrades to systems such as um, eliminating overboard discharge or replacements of existing systems? I can do that. Thank you. Anything else on page 7? 
I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on page six, this may have been discussed at length. You're not allowed to go back. <laughs> Since if I couldn't go get back, there would be no future. <laughs> we'll let you do it. Under filling in the RP3 zone, uh, in the case of a water dependent use, having to go through the floodplain in order to get to a water dependent use, um, would it be appropriate to have a special permit rather than no? Mr. Emery, I, I realize you, you referenced this earlier, but if you look on page <coughs> 5, um, section 19.2.8, permitted, prohibited, and special uses, um, it states in there that if there are prohibited activities which are part of an approved activity and you receive the approval you need, then you can also do the prohibited activity. So if, for example, you needed something to get to a water-dependent use, such as a pier, which is allowed, and that required some filling, you would be able, allowed to do the filling as part of getting your peer approval. Peer approval. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I missed that, but obviously I did. Thank you. Could I ask something following that? The way it's worded um, says that if um, the special permit has been received under the provisions, then they can do that non-permissible activity. Some of these are allowed by right. Would it follow that even though they don't have a special permit, they could in fact fill if it was a permitted use, such as um, uh, constructing nature trails? I would, my assumption would be in reading this is if you had an, uh, an activity that was permitted by right but incorporated a prohibited activity, you would have to get a special permit. For that prohibited activity. Because it says prohibited activities that are part of another activity which has received a special permit. And there would be some mechanism for getting a special permit for something that specifically says you can't do it? Well, you would be getting a special permit for something that you're allowed by right, but because you have to, for example, if you were asking to, um, let's see, something you're allowed, uh, wilderness area, wildlife preservation and refuge, let's say uh, you were going to put a trail in or, or something that's allowed by right, but it was going to require filling. Uh, the filling's not allowed, the, the trail is allowed by right. Um, I'd recommend you get a special permit for the trail, and then the, the filling would come as part of the special permit. Thank you. I believe we left off at page 7. Thank you, Ms. Emery. Number page 8. There. Um, the very first sentence, um, Shoreland Performance Overlay District that should be zoned. That one got by should okay. be zoned. It's the first one to match our previous. Page 10. I have a note in the margin here to add uh, sewer ordinance reference. Did that get ordered, uh, added? Uh, that's under um, C, subsection 2, uh, the last sentence in that first Thank paragraph. Mm -hmm. There we go. Anything else on page 10? Page 11. Mr. Chairman? Tom, I would uh, suggest that we reduce the, um, on page 11, residential, uh, 
the frontage footage for residential per dwelling unit adjacent to non title areas reduce it to 150 feet as long as the lot uh, area uh, remains the same 40,000 square feet any reason other than that you just think that the 200 is excessive I, I, I think it's excessive mm -hmm. as long as as long as you have the uh, minimum setback and you have mm -hmm. the uh, lot area of 40,000 square feet. Any other uh, feeling or consensus from the board? What's the uh, minimum standards? Did Two, they say 200? 200. So that would be a, a red flag for the DP. <coughs> you want to go to war with the DP over this one? Personally, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are we the only community that would be raising that particular red flag? In all the workshops I've attended, um, the comments that have been made are that the guidelines can be changed uh, if you can show special local circumstances, but uh, the couple areas where they said to just don't even bother trying were, were in these minimum standards. Um, don't try to redefine the shoreland zone. Uh, if if you like, I can I can research uh, how receptive uh, the state might informally be to reducing that to 150. What would be the reason why they have a difference here? Because of the non-tidal areas would be freshwater areas that would be more vulnerable to. Uh, I would assume they they're making the assumption that tidal areas are um, more readily able to to get rid of pollution. Basically, be non point source pollution runoff from uh, lawns or uh, crease from cars or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily tied to utility, it's more. Um, because, yeah, because uh, contaminants to water, I mean, even if you have a sewer system and you're, you're not adding anything to the soil, just the fact that someone is living close to the shore and is disturbing vegetation, encourages um, additional runoff, uh, you know, just, just cutting some trees down or, or putting a building in there is going to decrease the amount of vegetation holding the soil and you've got additional nutrients running into the water. That's what creates the, the, the algal blooms and um, the kind of things that, that lakes are dealing with now is there's just there's just too much in the water that's allowing uh, bacteria to grow. And when the bacteria grow, they use up the oxygen that the fish need, and you end up with dead ponds. By, by telling a tidal and non-tidal tidal, um, are they trying to refer this to strictly uh, freshwater frontage? That's my assumption, that, 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 they're, that they feel that protection of uh, non-tidal areas is, is more, more serious and you've got a much better ability, typically you would have a much better ability to flush an area if it's a tidal area. How many areas in town would actually be affected by this? Um, non-tidal areas. Um, well, anywhere you could build in town that's adjacent to fresh water, uh, wetlands, uh, streams, Great Pond, some of the smaller ponds. I, I guess that's where I get, uh, I, I don't want to drag this out, I, I know it's wasting the board's time, but if, if you're developing next to a wetland and the function of the wetland is to um, intercept uh, runoff and, and nutri uh, nutrients and other pollutants, and at the same time you've made the same, you've maintained the same density and you've maintained the same setback uh, standards and clearing standards, it just seems onerous to me to um, go to a 200 foot frontage. It's, it's a but that would lower the density. That would be the intent. <coughs> no, it wouldn't. Not, not really. You still have a minimum lot size of 40,000 square feet. Yeah, but you, you'd have anyway, you reduce the number of lots that can qualify for a residential unit. You would have fewer, perhaps fewer units directly in the water, but uh, that's probably mm -hmm. what you're getting at. Reducing the density next to non-tidal areas. What's the consensus 
I would I, be in favor of, of lowering that to 150. Myself. I would not either. Sure. <coughs> I think I'd, I'd just as soon as keep it at 200. Sure. Um, I certainly support Maureen checking with the state, and they may repeat the same thing, but in support of Tom. I'd suggest we, we check with the, with the state. Um, I, I think if there's any resistance at all, it's, well worth, it's not worth doing battle. Uh, but I think it's worthy of uh, checking with the state. <coughs> Anything else on page 11? I, I have one question. Sure, Tim. Um, on the, under the old setback line, which I noticed that we, uh, the original ordinance had uh, 150 feet, and now we're reducing it to 100 feet. Under, uh, uh, page 12. Is that number a one? Reading well, or? number one is very deceptive because it's almost always replaced by number two, which then gets replaced by number three, and even that setback can be waived. You can get a variance for it. So it, it, it looks as if 150 is our ex existing setback, but I'm not aware of any situation where that was ever used. You know, it's on page 11 or 12. You know, page 13. <coughs> Number under F7. Now it's probably a silly question, but it, measure, it mentions uh, it shall not exceed 20 feet of height above the pier, wharf, dock, or other structure measure to where. Is it just to the pier deck or to the pier? Under structure or what? Mm -hmm. um, page thirteen seven. Okay. I would assume that's from the, the the top base of the pier, because the shoreline zone does have a um, just it's a total building. Yeah, okay. because there is a, a limit in the shoreline zone that you can't have any building that's higher than thirty five feet. So this would be a limit on how high a, a structure could be as it's sitting on top of the pier. Okay. Anything else on page 13? Page 14. Page 15. <coughs> Another silly one on page 15. Um, it's okay, Steve. You can be in charge of silly questions tonight. Okay. Thank you. Um, be at the top of the page, internal travel aisles, approximately 20 feet wide. Can't that be pinned down to, say, 18 feet wide, 19 feet wide, 20 feet wide, or something? I, I, I suspect that what happened here, uh, a lot of communities were offended by these standards because they felt that they had their own standards for a minimum parking lot size and aisle widths, and, and the town of Cape Elizabeth also has several standards like that. Um, on the other hand, uh, someone could come in and, and create something that was obviously never intended to be a travel aisle and label it as such, and there would be no restrictions. So I believe it says approximately 20 feet for that reason. Um, Either the town can insert its own number in there. Um, we could do that and just just have a, a fixed number that a, a, an aisle shall be no shall be X feet. If, that's if you look in A up above, it says approximately 10 feet wide and right. 20 feet long. Then it gets very specific for a boat trailer should be 40 feet long. Just, if I'm not, it seems to me that they're putting too much leeway. I mean, it, it should be set up so it's much clearer. Okay. If, if the goal is to reduce uh, uh, stormwater runoff into adjacent uh, water bodies, I'll offer up a 9-foot wide parking space, 18 feet long, with a 24-foot travel aisle. Question about the, the, the change or, or Tom's uh, suggestion? 
Judy? Does our ordinance speak to the expected size of um, parking spaces elsewhere? I'm, I don't recollect any particular place where it, it says parking spaces shall be X long and X width. There may be something in there and I can check it, uh, but I don't remember ever seeing anything that had a specific size in it. Okay, because 9 by 18 sounds good to me. 24. Typically, you can you can call the travel aisle 20 and you can call the spaces 20 and you still end up with 60 feet. Is the but additional four no. feet needed if you have a, an 18 foot long um, parking space? It is. We, we really don't get four more feet. That's it's just a matter of delineation. And there should be a larger space for trailers, obviously. Um, on that on that trailer uh, space, is that is, should that be a, a shall or a may? Because I mean, do we want to require that they be exactly forty feet, or they can be less, right? Mm -hmm. so it should be may. But if we take it out completely. The, the verb. They don't say it. It just says internal travel aisles approximately 20 feet. A typical parking space approximately 9 feet by 18 feet. And it should be a boat trail of 40 feet. Mm -hmm. We're missing Janet McKay, our, our <laughs> specialist. <laughs> 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 Has it already passed her approval? Uniformity. comment on, on that uh, uh, any problem with taking that out the shall be does that contradict uh, the you've already the got a main? verb at the beginning okay. and three the following shall apply no. anything else on page 15 16 I have a question. Yes. <coughs> I don't know what an unscarified buffer strip is. <laughs> Scarified has to do with scratching the, the surface, but I don't know where you're seeing that. Uh, line. It's, it's number seven, second line. Okay. Uh, the, am I, 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 am I, I correct? Scarified is, but I don't know what a scarified buffer strip is. I'm sorry to say. It would be it would be a, an area mm -hmm. where there hadn't been any activity, any construction activity, or anything. It was undisturbed. The idea is like virgin land. Undisturbed land. Undisturbed. Natural. Well, the the point of scarifying is to create more permeability. Is that right, Tom? Well, you want to loosen up the soil for uh, right. planting. The, uh, I would guess that they don't want it scarified, <coughs> so that it acts more as a ditch that carries water. No, they want the buffer strips unscarified. They don't. They don't want them cleared, planted. Okay. Uh, they want them left natural, so that the understory material absorbs the runoff. Does that word, does that word properly describe what we're looking for? Mr. Chairman, um, yes. one Sorry. suggested revision under. Um, H sewage disposal standards mm -hmm. to keep in conformity what, with what we said earlier. Could it read all subsurface sewage disposal systems shall be installed in conformance with the state of Maine subsurface waste water disposal rules and the town of Cape Elizabeth sewer ordinance or sewage ordinance? Um, the reason I didn't put that in is uh, this section is one of the sections where. I didn't take exactly word for word what was in the guidelines book because we seem to have more protection in our local ordinance than the state did. Mm -hmm. If you read under actually numbers one through three on the following page are already existing in the ordinance. Um, and those three sections reference chapter 15, which is our sewage ordinance. And that's why I didn't put it in the title, although I can. Uh, I don't think that I care then. Okay. 
Well, that's really broad-based language. It says whatever, um, I believe what it says is anything that the state uses is a, a standard or rule applies. In other words, if the state adopts a national plumbing code, or is it referring to a specific, um, well, it is. 